So everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We're live um, both here on Zoom and on Facebook. So the nonprofit National Popular Vote is delighted to be hosting today's conversation with Rick Tyler and Saul Anousis. National Popular Vote was founded in 2005 and advocates for the National Popular Vote Bill, which is a state-based plan that works to reform the Electoral College. When in effect, this bill will guarantee the presidency to the winner of the most popular votes in all 50 states and DC, making every vote equal in presidential elections. So far, this bill has been enacted in 16 jurisdictions with 196 electoral votes. Rick Tyler is co-founder of Foundry Strategies, a political strategic and communications consulting firm. He's currently a political analyst for MSNBC. Previously, he was a senior member of Senator Ted Cruz's campaign team, serving as the national spokesman and communications director for Cruz for President. Rick's book, which we'll be discussing, is Still Right, an immigrant-loving, hybrid-driving, composting American makes the case for conservatism. Welcome, Rick. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Saul Anousis was chairman of the Michigan Republican Party from 2005 to 2009 and was a candidate for chairman of the Republican National Committee in 2009 and 2011. Saul is a managing partner of Coast to Coast Strategies and serves as a senior consultant to National Popular Vote. Welcome, Saul. Great to be with you guys. Thanks. I'll be moderating this conversation today. I'm Eileen Reavy, and I serve as the National Grassroots Director for National Popular Vote. So for those of you tuning in via Zoom, you are able to submit questions via the Q&A feature if desired. Um, so please submit any questions you have down at the bottom of your box there. Um, we'll also be monitoring questions that come in through Facebook. We've reserved the last portion of this webinar for questions from the audience. Um, so submit them at any time and we'll get to them at the end. This webinar is being shared live on Facebook and will be available afterwards both on Facebook and on National Popular Votes YouTube channel. So Rick and Saul, thank you both so much for joining us. I'm excited to get started and have this conversation with the both of you. There you go. So Rick, in your book, Still Right, you give the current electoral system a failing grade and you make the conservative case for a national popular vote. So why do you think the current electoral system is failing? Well, you know, when I first heard of the national popular vote, I did what a lot of conservatives have done and, um, and which they couldn't be blamed for. You just do the quick math and you realize that in many elections, because I've been a life, had been a lifelong Republican, that um, our, our team would lose. And so I didn't really pay much attention. I just thought this was, you know, one of those things that the, the left is trying to change. You know, they like to change a lot of things and they're going to change this too. And, um, you know, it's all designed so that Democrats can win um, the election. But then it was actually in, in conversations with Saul that I figured that I started to really look at it. And in fact, I got so excited about it. I actually did a, a radio interview on the, this topic and a friend of mine who helped me write the book, uh, still write, um, he's, he called me afterwards and said, you know what? I always thought the electoral college was such a boring topic. I thought, oh, he's talking about the electoral college. And all of a sudden you made it so interesting as the way Saul made it interesting to me, because there's so much that's so exciting about it. And, and I come at it from a pr conservative perspective, and I'm sure we'll get into it, um, but it does primarily give states a lot more leverage uh, in national gover governance. And you might not think that's, that's obviously apparent, uh, but it's from everything. It's from federal spending, it's to where candidates campaign, it's to the issues we talk about. And you can see it so dramatically uh, in these final weeks up until the, uh, until the 2020 election. Yeah, and so some of those things that you highlight in your book. Um, so an excerpt that I wanted to read and, and ask you about. So you highlight that presidential candidates spend as much as three quarters of their money in a total of 10 swing states and the rest is spread out in the other 40 states. And in the 2016 presidential race, 
between the party conventions and election day, the Clinton and Trump campaigns held 71 campaign events in Florida, 55 in North Carolina, 54 in Pennsylvania, and the, so many other states in the rest of the country were completely left out of the general election campaign. What do you think that that does for our electoral system and, and getting people out to vote and feeling like they, their vote matters in the presidential election? Well, people have sort of taken for granted that there's always swing states, right? We know what the swing states are. Um, the upper Midwest, where Saul is from, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, have uh, were, are now swing states. They weren't always swing states. Pennsylvania used to be a swing state. It's now returned to swing state status. And in order to win the election, you've got to win uh, enough electoral votes. So the candidates, of course, are going to spend most of their time in the states uh, that could go either way. And that's where they're going to put all their resources. And so we sort of take that, we've taken that for granted. And, and all the news media talks about swing states. And of course, Donald Trump is spending his time in Pennsylvania and Bi Joe Biden spending his time in Pennsylvania. They've been all over Michigan. They've been all over Wisconsin. Um, Arizona, maybe a swing state this time around. Florida has been a, a swing state for a long, long time. And you think, you know, we're just not a swing state. So it's, you know, it's just not happening in our state. And you think that, so it's not that important. Well, it is important. Not only is it important because you're not being campaigned to directly, it's important because when the president becomes president, they're of course politically focused on reelection in general. So you get a first term president, they wanna get reelected. They've gotta pay attention to the swing states, which is why today you're hearing all this talk about manufacturing. Well, manufacturing is, is something that the upper Midwest is famous for, uh, and it's key to their economy, but it's not key to other economies. Other economies uh, in, the, in the rural South or in Maine, where it's fishing and agriculture and timber and lumber, and in Hawaii, where it's you know, almost 100% um, uh, tourism, uh, in California, agriculture, the wine country, high tech, right? No one's talking about these issues. Why? Um, look at the look at the the fires in California. This is a this is a, a national catastrophe, and yet no one. It's gotten relatively little. Um, co it's gotten some coverage, but the campaigns haven't really talked about it at all. Why? Because California is not in contention. The Democrats will win California. Well, under a national popular vote, guess what? Every Republican vote, not only in California, and I'll include Los Angeles and San Francisco. There are a lot of Republicans in Los Angeles and San Francisco, not nearly as many as, as Democrats, but they would all have to be campaigned to. Uh, and then you, what you end up with is the candidates talk about much broader issues um, that most Americans have in common, and not just regional issues, as we're seeing today uh, with manufacturing, and in some cases, law enforcement. Yeah, I live in Oregon, and we're, you know, all along the West Coast, we're having these wildfires, and Washington, Oregon, and California are all safely democratic states when it comes to how they're going to vote in the electoral college. But I know in Oregon, the area that's impacted the most is actually, you know, a, a Republican congressional district. So those folks are being slighted, even though, you know, they're not necessarily people that are going to vote blue, but still their voices are not coming out in the presidential campaign. What I think is exciting, actually, is if, if you're a Republican in a deep uh, blue state, under a national uh, popular vote, uh, your vote counts as much as every uh, you know, red voter in, in deep red Texas, or every blue voter in, in Dallas, Texas, or Austin, Texas, would count every bit as much as every vote uh, in rural Oklahoma or Wyoming. They all count the same, because, and that, in fact, is what was intended. I think we've lost a lot of state leverage frankly, when we passed the 17th Amendment, which gave senators, the, uh, they were subject to the popular vote and not elected by their legislatures. And people think, well, that's so, that's, you know, the backroom, back, you know, uh, backroom deals. And well, when they severed that relationship, the states no longer have any real influence over um, legis congressional legislation. There's almost nobody to call. Yet when the legislatures used to send the senators to Congress, and if they didn't like what the senator was doing to their particular state, they could call up that senator and say, you know, by God, you better, you better fix that uh, because we've got someone else all lined up, ready to go. Um, and so, the legis so there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of leverage. And I think a part of uh, the national popular vote would restore 
uh, leverage to the states so that we don't have just um, in any given year, and I think it's getting narrower and narrower, anywhere from you know six to 10 states that really matter politically, which means they matter uh, to federal budgets. Uh, and we should restore that to you know your your governor, you're the president of, of 50 states uh, plus the territories. So Saul, you know, can you expand on that? Is this something that we're seeing with battleground states? Is it just in the most recent elections that we're having this problem, where it's six or 12 states that are really determining the outcome of the election, or is this something that we've seen for a longer period of time? Well, I think if you look all the way back to, you know, the 19th century here, basically, we have gotten to a smaller and smaller degree of states that actually matter. I mean, the last presidential candidate that, can, that campaigned in all 50 states was Richard Nixon during his first race in 1960, and he probably shouldn't have done it then because we were probably down to 35, you know, or less uh, battleground states. And as Rick pointed out, today, you know, you start out saying there might be 10 to 12, and by the time we get down to it, we may be concentrating on three to six. So the big problem here is four out of five Americans live in a state that is decidedly Republican or decidedly Democrat, and therefore it makes no political sense, no common sense whatsoever for Republican or Democratic candidates to campaign in those states. And so for all practical purposes, what happens is we elect the president of the battleground states of America versus the president of the United States of America. And I think that, you know, from my perspective, you know, this proposal here gives us a chance to allow states to decide what is in their best interest and their selfish best interest to make sure their voices are heard. So you take a look at it and you have the largest state in the country being California. The next two largest states are New York and, and Texas. All three of them are either decidedly Republican or decidedly Democratic states and Republican and or Democratic candidates completely ignore three of the largest states in the country during presidential elections, except for maybe fundraising. So their influence with regards to what policies are important to us? How do we address these policies? Who should be appointed to uh, you know, judgeships or, or administration positions becomes secondary to somebody who happens to be in Ohio or Florida that happen to be the quintessential battleground states. So I think that the key from a, it's truly a, a, a nonpartisan position. The unique, pos the, the unique proposal that I think is here is that whether you're a Republican or Democrat, you wanna make sure your vote counts. Now, I happen to be, you know, I come from Michigan, which has been a quintessential battleground state on and off for the last 30 years. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, when we're on, we're hot and everybody's paying attention. But in the middle of the campaign, if we go down, we can be out and nobody pays attention. And that's not what the founders intended. That's not how the system was set up. It, I think that the idea of having every voter in every state be politically relevant every time is a critical part of our democracy. Um, we are a Republican form of government in the small r sense. We elect our representatives to represent us. Um, that's not going to change if we, if we go to a presidential election that is done by a national popular vote. Because look, we, we elect 514,000 elected officials in this country, and all of them are elected by who gets the most votes but one. The one candidate that represents the country as a whole, and that has created some real, real distortions in public policy, as, as Rick has pointed out, and even in politics because presidential candidates on both sides ignore the 40 or so non-battleground flyover states. Thank you. And yeah, let's let's talk about some of those policy implications that we see of, of the favoritism. You know, Rick talked about manufacturing. Are there other examples that you've seen when you've looked at this topic? Sure, look, I, I would submit you have ethanol because of Iowa. Uh, we have prescription D because of Florida. Um, President Bush, the big free trader, passed steel tariffs for Pennsylvania, Ohio during the auto crisis. Now, regardless of whether those were good public policy perspectives, they weren't determined based on what was good for the country as a whole. They were determined based on what was important for the few battleground states were there. Uh, Matthew Dowd had this very famous quote where he, he talked about when he served as a the kind of a, a consultant to the Bush presidency, that they only poll in 18 states because there are only potentially 18 you know, battleground states uh, that may come around. And so the issues that are important to the president and the cabinet and the people who are actually setting policy at the federal level are, and again, this is a bipartisan issue, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, as Rick pointed out, they're already worrying about reelection. So they're only paying attention to the issues that affect those swing states. Um, I, I think one of the best examples I, I like using when I, when I talk to people is when we had the oil crisis in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, it, 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 it hit and New Orleans was all in the middle of it and, and it was front page of the New York Times and everybody was paying attention to it. And, you know, by day two, we already had FEMA in there and everyone was looking out to take care of it. By day three, they had flown in people worldwide to cap the oil spill. 
and it was sitting there going from, you know, Louisiana to Alabama to Mississippi. But on day nine was the first time that an oil ball kind of rolled up onto the shores of Florida, and you had President Obama flying in a helicopter, famously land on the beach and get out with waiters and declare it was the greatest environmental disaster in the history of our country. But it took nine days for that declaration, not because it was good or bad from his perspective, but it finally hit a battleground state where it matters. And so when, when Rick talks about the wildfires in Western you know, United States where California, Oregon, and Washington, non-battleground states, flyover states, presidential candidates are paying attention, the president's paying attention, but not like he would have if they were happening in Ohio or Florida. So, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a water leak in Florida or Ohio, it becomes a national, you know, disaster where if you've got, you know, floods coming into New Orleans, it becomes, you know, yeah, it's a problem, but it's, you know, it doesn't get the same attention. And so that's, that's the, that's kind of the policy distortion that currently happens under the current system. And it's that winner take all rule that determines that only certain states matter. And so, you know, if you're, if you're in Utah or Oklahoma, which are solid Republican states, nothing wrong with the folks there, but Republicans know they're going to win, they ignore them. Democrats know they're going to lose, they ignore them. If you're in Delaware or Illinois and you're in a solidly Democrat state, same thing happens on the other side. And so when you create a system where every voter in every state is politically relevant every time, then it becomes an important issue for everybody involved. And look, I, I, I think that you know, Rick and I are both conservatives. We're more than happy to take our case to the American people and win or lose. I think we're going to do okay. I think Republicans can win nationwide, but we've really never run a national popular vote. I mean, you know, I went back to 1988 and took a look at the statistics and, and about 95 to 98 percent of all the resources, whether it's presidential visits or campaign money, has been spent in 10 states or less since 1988. So we're not even campaigning in the 40 other states. We're not even paying attention to the issues that matter in the 40 other states. And whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, that ought to be a problem for you. I mean, the, the issue should be that every voter ought to matter, everybody's opinion ought to matter, and candidates ought to campaign to people in all 50 states to make their case to the American people, especially the one and the only one that truly represents the country as a whole, which is a presidency. And Rick, I want to ask you, because I know that you uh, were the former executive director of the Maine Republican Party earlier in your career. What do you think has the implications are for a system where the presidential campaign might have totally ignored or completely focused on a state like Maine um, during the presidential election campaign because of its status as winner take all? Maybe if it was battleground, you got attention, but more likely it wasn't. And, and what implications that has for you down ballot? Well, Maine is actually one of the unusual states that allocates its electors by congressional district. Um, and so it's half a swing state because <laughs> uh, uh, President Trump won uh, District 2 in Maine in the last cycle. Um, he may win it again this cycle. It's, it doesn't look as close as it was last cycle. So, so you know, the second district in Maine was a, was a battleground half state, but the rest of it you know, which is the Portland area south and in the southern part of the state uh, really got ignored. But if in fact um, it was winner take all everywhere, then then you really have a president who would have to expand uh, where they're going to campaign. And, you know, I, I want to pick up on what Saul was saying, because I hear a lot of, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, well, you know, the simple math is that Hillary would have won. And they're right. Hillary would have won if if it was a national uh it was vote if you won the presidency by national popular vote hillary would have won but that completely ignores the fact that both campaigns were running an electoral college strategy they and so if you had a national popular vote they would run completely different campaigns and let me give you an illustration that 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 makes it brings the point home hillary was actually toward the end of the campaign because her polling was so wrong it was not they were not paying attention to wisconsin Pennsylvania and Michigan. She thought she had won those votes. What she was trying to do is run up the vote tally so that she would have a mandate. It's a very important thing. If you're going to win, you want to win by as much as possible so you can claim that, that I have a mandate and I can get a lot uh, done based on the mandate. So she was actually pursuing a national popular vote strategy toward the end of her campaign. Well, guess what? It cost her the election because we don't have a national vote strategy. We, we have an, an electoral strategy. Uh, whereas President Trump 
he was told by Kellyanne Conway because he was very nervous in 2016, the national uh, polls were going against him and Kellyanne Conway said, don't worry about that. You've got to worry about the battleground states. Uh, David Bossie, who was also an, an advisor to the campaign, told the president the same thing. You have to run as if you're running for governor of these battleground states. And so he did that and he won. So if we had a national popular vote, Donald Trump would not have run a electoral strategy campaign. He would run a national popular vote strategy. And I submit he probably would have won in 2016 had he pursued that type, that type of a strategy. So it's really important to, to think um, that you can't just look retrospectively at the math and say, oh, well, let's see who would have won. That's not, that's not the way it is. The other criticism I hear a lot is that, well, Democrats could just fly into, into cities and campaign there and the Republicans would have to campaign in rural America. Well, one, it doesn't actually work out that way. When you look at where all the events are, take place between Democrats and Republicans, they often, they're, they're kind of split between rural and, uh, and, and also inner cities, but also ignores the fact that there's a huge number of Republicans who live in cities just by sheer numbers. Now they're outnumbered by Democrats, uh, but if you take the whole country as a whole and you split between rural and cities, and you can see it in the in the in the in the, pop, in the vote map. You know, it look, the country looks all red. Well, that's because it's rural and and, and spread out. Um, but the population differences between rural and urban are actually pretty close. They're not they're not these. It's not a big huge difference between them. And so, I think it, it would be very competitive. And here's the here's the final thing that that people get nervous about. I often hear Democrats, many Democrats say we ought to get rid of the Electoral College. Well, that would take a constitutional amendment. That would be very, very difficult to do. And then under this strategy, states are forming a compact to in effect give you a national popular vote without changing the Constitution. And why is that important? Well, one, I don't take changing the Constitution very lightly um, because if, if, and we're learning because people say, why do we have the Electoral College? And the reason was, is because the, the smaller states were very worried about being overwhelmed by the larger states. And it has actually worked very well. As Saul mentioned, the three largest states are ignored completely. And so you have a lot of smaller states who in, in, in this system have become overrepresented. Over but let's say Saul and I are wrong, which is possible. Not, it hasn't happened yet, but we could be wrong. You could actually, the states could say, well, that's not really working out for us. Let's, let's get out of this compact and go back. We'll go back to being an electoral, normal electoral college state. They can do that under this system. You're not locked in and, and you have to, you know, somehow go through a, another constitutional process again. So I think it's very, ele it's very elegant in, in, from a conservative perspective. I don't want to launch into something. I don't know for sure that it's not going to work out. This allows us to do it. Uh, and if it doesn't work, you can undo it without having to go through a constitutional amendment process. And, and I'd like to just add one thing. I mean, I, this is really the federalist approach to how to actually reform the Electoral College. You know, Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution gives the state legislators the, the exclusive right to determine how their electors are chosen. So the founding fathers, in their infinite wisdom, wanted the state legislatures to decide should we use a winner take all rule? Should we, you know, appoint our electors? And if you look historically, there was a time when legislators gave the governors the right to appoint electors. There were times when the legislature themselves appointed electors. There were even other times when the legislature set up electoral college or electoral uh, districts to run in and people ran in that. And it was kind of moving into and coming out of the civil war that we really moved to the winner take all rule and ultimately what they called back then the unit rule. And we just got comfortable and left it there. And it was okay back then because most of the states were competitive. The two party system wasn't as strong as it was today. So you had presidential candidates campaigning across the country. So this is the constitutional way to reform the electoral college. This is what the founders and the federalists wanted to happen. They wanted states to act in their selfish best interest to set up a system that was better for them. It does provide a backdoor that if it doesn't work the way, if there are unintended consequences, we can get out and look at proportional plans. We can look at as Rick mentioned, you know, Nebraska and Maine use congressional district plan. Someone else might come up with even a different plan on how to do it. But the idea is that even the founders and virtually every political leader in the country wants to make sure that citizens have their voices heard. 
And when you have a system where four out of five Americans are completely ignored in a presidential election, it's just bad for the process. It's not a mandate for them to lead. And it creates, I would argue, it, it, it's part of the reason that we have this huge partisan divide today in this country is that people don't feel like the country actually spoke, that the country actually elected. Yeah, they won by the system and the rules that are in the game, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're the right rules. And, and our founders gave us a way to do that. Article two, section one of the constitution gives the legislature the right to do that. And, and so it is the right way to do it. Um, we don't have to do a constitutional amendment, not because it's harder, it's because it's not what you don't need it. It's not what it's intended to do. The rules were set up so the legislature would actually decide this. So I, I think it is a federalist approach, at least from my perspective as a conservative Republican, this is the right way to change the system and reform the system. And, and uh, the state legislators are closest to the people and they can make a determination. Does this make more sense for my state or not? And, and I think, as you mentioned, starting out, I mean, 15 states have already passed this. I think there's another 15 or 16 that have passed it in at least one house of their legislature. Um, you know, I, I take a look at states like Oklahoma passed it in the Senate by almost two thirds of the vote. Arizona passed it in the House by two thirds vote. I mean, these are solid Republican states. The Georgia Senate, two thirds of the Senate actually co-sponsored a bill. I mean, so there's a lot of bipartisan support for this because it is a fair process. It is the right way to move forward, but it's also a very confusing process, which is why, you know, uh, having conversations like this are very useful. Uh, and Saul, can you tell us um, when this bill will go into effect? So the, the way the compact is set up is that when enough states that have 270 electoral votes or more join the compact, and are in the compact as of July 1st of the election year, the bill actually takes place. So as an example today, 15 states plus the District of Columbia have joined the compact. They only have 196 electoral votes. So nothing changes. So we're past the July 1st deadline. Those states will participate just like they always did. The winner take all rule still plays in effect to them. And they just wait until other states join the compact. Now going forward four years from now, I think there's a very good chance that you know, there's at least 10 or 12 other states that have been very seriously considering this compact. It's been introduced in almost all 50 states at one time or another. So there's been conversations in all 50 states about moving to a system like this. And uh, I think that when the states, when let's say six or seven other states, depending on the size and how many electors they have, hit that magic 270 or more, we'll actually have an election run using the national popular vote to determine how your state's electors are chosen. So we don't eliminate the electoral college like a constitutional amendment would do. We don't take away the state's rights with regards to administering those elections and determining how those electors are chosen. But instead of using the winner take all rule in your state, you're now gonna take a look at who wins the national popular vote in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia and then send your electors to the electoral college based on that result. So that in effect will create a system where every voter in every state becomes politically relevant every time. And I think that to me is the beauty of the system. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Rick, I wanted to ask you about something that you touched on a moment ago about the polarizing nature of kind of where our country is at right now. And, and it's something that you covered in your book as well. Um, so when we talk about the presidency and whoever getting the most votes wins, do you, can you elaborate on how you think that this could be potentially something that helps us with that polarization? Well, I think that if, if we have a national popular vote, um, you would not have... Um... Oh, we lost him. <laughs> Oh goodness, we did lose him. All right, uh, well, we'll give him a minute uh, to, to join again. So Saul, when you're talking to um, Republican legislators around the country about this bill, um, is the fact that it's uh, not abolishing the constitution and, or excuse me, not abolishing the electoral college a selling point for them? Is that something that well, they are? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think from a Republican perspective, you know, the, the when this, Bill first, when people started talking about the national popular vote initially, they talked about the constitutional amendment that would eliminate the electoral college. And most conservatives are kind of what we refer to as federalists and want states' rights and wants, they, they like the fact that states have this influence, that states determine how their elections are compelled. You know, many states have, you know, mail-in ballots, you know, for seven days in advance or, or voting starts seven days in advance. Others have approved mail-in ballots. Others think it's a bad idea. Some let 
felons vote, others don't let felons vote. So each state has the right to set and determine the rules and conditions under which people participate. And it's based on the historical and the kind of cultural differences in those different states. And that's a healthy process. And the founders and the Constitution wanted the states to have greater impact and role in there. So when the interstate compact came about and it basically preserved, and I would even argue strengthened the Electoral College in the sense that giving all 50 states the ability to make sure that their voters actually mattered when it came to electoral, electoral college was very important. And so like, you know, if you take a look at Republican legislators around the country, number one, they ask, is it constitutional? When we go over article one, section two, that actually does explain that the, that the legislators have the right to do that. Then number two, they talk about, well, what did the founders want? And is, do we respect federalism in the sense that we're not taking away states' rights? And when we talk about the fact that, look, I mean, 40 states have no rights. It doesn't matter if you're a big state or a small state. I mean, you know, people, you know, originally when we had the Great Compromise and we appointed the two members of the United States Senate, and then they used the same system for the Electoral College, part of what the founders were talking about was making sure that small states were protected. But today we've got, what I think there's like 13 small states that have four electors or less, and six are decidedly Republican, six are decidedly Democrat, so they get completely ignored. And the only one that's paid attention to is New Hampshire because it's a swing state. Not because it's New Hampshire, not because it's a small state, not because it's a you know, unique state, it's because it's a swing state. And that's not the criteria, that's not the process that the founders intended. And, I'm, and I, I don't think that's what most people think. So I think that the fact that it preserves the Electoral College, and as I said, I think it not only preserves it, but strengthens the Electoral College, that it makes sure that every voter in every state is relevant is important, and that state legislatures preserve their right to determine how those electors are chosen. As Rick uh, said, it also gives them that back door that if they don't like it, they can change it to another way. But that's exactly how it was intended to be. This isn't a circumventing the Constitution or going around the Constitution. This is following, I mean, I'm a strict constructionist. Article 2, Section 1 says the state legislature shall decide. Not, the, not a constitutional amendment, not Congress, not someone else. The state legislature being the closest body of the people should determine how we elect a president. And that's why this system and why the Inter National Pipe Road Interstate Compact, I think, is so unique and is getting bipartisan support around the country. Oh, thank you. Rick, it looks like you've uh, joined I'm us. I'm back. <laughs> Hi. A little technical challenge. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Um, so I, I'll re-ask my question, um, talking about polarization in this country uh, and the way that parties are shifting is kind of a, a theme in your book. So how do you see electing the president by national popular vote and every vote being equal playing into that? Well, I, I think that if you went to a national popular vote, that the presidential candidates would have to uh, talk about issues m much more broadly, right? They would, they would not be able to talk about uh, simply regional issues or things that are going on uh, say in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, because it's a swing state or things that are going on uh, in particular in, in Florida because it's a, it's a swing state. And it'd be, it would uh, it would be a, a much uh, a broader message. And the other thing is that, for example, it, so I'll use a similar example, I'll use another one, and I'll pick on Michigan a little bit here, is um, when Obama bailed out General Motors in Michigan, um, a lot of that was because of you know the manufacturing of Michigan being a swing state. But, but notice what he did is he actually took money for, you know from the federal government, helped the company, um, and in the free market, if you're a free market trader, like you're supposed to buy something and get something in return, right? Well, he actually took taxpayer money from Texas and California and New York and gave it to GM in Michigan, right? Now, what did those voters get in New York, California, and, and Texas? They got nothing. Now, the, the GM plant in Lordsville, you know, in Ohio, uh, that plant, you know, that was the one, one of the ones you're supposed to save that ended up closing down. Um, but you wouldn't have presidents bailing out, you know, companies in swing states. I, I don't think if, if GM had been in a rock solid Republican state that he would have, been, he would have bailed it out or if it had been in a rock solid Democratic state that I think he might have bailed it out. But that's not the criteria. That shouldn't be the decision um, that presidents make in terms of national policy or how they spend taxpayers' money is based on the interests of a few and not the interests of the whole. Yeah, I mean, not to mention it seems 
not just like bad policy, but as a taxpayer, I, I don't want the person sitting in the White House, regardless of if they're the same political party as me or not, to be able to use my tax dollars to help them win re-election. I mean, that doesn't seem like that's, that's a built-in advantage for the incumbent, but that's just also not the way that our government really should be run, right? No, that's exactly right. We should, we should, we're supposed, we're all supposed to be equal under the law. We're all supposed to have a, our, you know, our vote. I mean, it's ingrained in our, it's, it's kind of ironic in a sense. It's because it's in, it's ingrained in who we are as a people that all, all men are created equal. Today, we'd say men and women. Um, that's in the birth certificate. Um, and we think of us as an egalitarian society, at least that's the ideal, uh, and that every vote should be equal. But when you really think about it in the presidential race, it is not equal. Here's the other thing that I think is really important is if a national popular vote were enacted, then voter participation should logically go up in the states that were not swing states. And so you, you probably would get much more competitive House and Senate races, and you'd probably get a different kind of, of candidates running in House and Senate races. And my guess they would have to be, they would be much less polarizing because it's easy to act. We've gotten to a point in our politics where we activate one base or we activate the other base and those are the people who are going to win. Well, if there was a lot more voter participation, most people aren't wired like Saul and I. I mean, Saul ran for national chairman. He was on the national committee. Uh, I was a Republican executive director. You know, we live and breathe politics and we're, and we're not normal. We're, let's face it, we're just, we're not normal people. Most people, you know, are doing normal things. You know, they go to church on Sunday morning, they play, they play, uh, they might play golf or sports with the kids. They're, they're working hard. They're putting their kids through call, all those things. And they have, they don't have as much time to think about, about politics. Well, if suddenly everybody's vote counters a lot more participation, then they're not narrowly focused on picking teams, the Republican team or the Democratic team. They're just looking for the people who would best represent their interests, both in the House and the Senate. So I think in a way, uh, the national popular vote would engage people to be more civic minded. And I think we would get better quality legislators. And I'll just add that uh, what Rick is talking about turnout, if you take a look at battleground states versus non-battleground states, on average, a battleground state has 9 to 11% higher voter participation than a non-battleground state. So just from a factual standpoint, your, your observation, Rick, is actually true. I mean, those people who know their vote matters and count, turn out and vote. And, and on average, it's 9 to 11%. So you're talking about a 70% plus voter turnout in battleground states, and many non-battleground states drop to the 50% level. And that's not good and for our country as a whole either. And if you think about it, it's called, why is it called a battleground state? It's called a battleground state because it's ideologically split down the middle. And so if you had everybody's vote, vote count in there, and then everybody would become a battleground state. And guess what? They would be probably more ideologically split down the middle than they are now. As far as turnout, I uh, always like to point to the fact that so millennials have spent, which I mean, they're all the way up to age 39 at this point for the millennial generation. They've spent at least 30% of their life with a president who was not originally elected by the national popular vote. And Generation Z, who many of whom will be voting for the first time this year, every member of Gen Z has spent at least 50% of their life with the pre US president having been originally one with less votes. And I just think for the people that are the younger generations, we want them to turn out and vote. We want them to be engaged how can we expect them to when this is the system that they're seeing for the most important office in the country? Um, so I'm gonna open it up for some of the questions that we've gotten from the audience here. Um, we've had a number of them come in. Um, so I think, Saul, maybe you can answer this one first. So once the compact reaches the requisite 270 electoral votes, what do you think will be the strongest challenges to its constitutionality? Well, look, we're a litigious society, so I suspect there will be lots of different um, uh, challenges. The problem for the legal challenges is that the Constitution is very clear. Um, the good news is we're going to have a, a new conservative judge on the court here in the Supreme Court, and I think that it will be a fairly slam dunk decision to say the Constitution says what it says. It says the state legislature has the right to determine you know, how electors are chosen. And, and uh, you know, this, this is exactly what we're doing with the compact. 
but having said that, I mean, look, I think people will, will challenge it on equal protection. But the problem is equal protection was designed to take care of equal protection within the states, not interstate. So there will be an argument going back and forth there. Uh, one of the issues that people keep bringing up is that many compacts require a con congressional consent. Well, um, congressional consent has been determined by the Supreme Court to basically be necessary when it has interstate implications, not state implications. This is clearly an intrastate uh, bill, but doesn't mean people won't bring it up. Uh, there will probably be several other challenges that people will come up with. I mean, there are people obviously who oppose this and, and, and will find going to the courts the easy way of doing it. But I think the hard part for them is that this is so basic and so fundamental. I mean, there's only 17 words in the Constitution that basically describe the Electoral College, and it very clearly gives the state legislature the right to determine how to do that. So I think most of those challenges will ultimately be summarily dismissed by the time it gets to the Supreme Court. Thanks. So this next one is for you, Rick. Um, you know, we have a lot of people that are tuning in that are advocates for the National Popular Vote Bill in their own state, many of whom are in states, you know, where it's a Republican trifecta, like in Florida. So what do you say to those folks? Um, what should th their main talking points be when they're trying to get their state legislators on board with this? Well, they should talk to st their state legislators about, now look, Florida would be a difficult state because it is a swing state. You're gonna have a hard time convincing swing states because they've got, you know, they've got the gravy train uh, because they've got all the money coming in, both from uh, candidates, political campaigns, advertising and campaigning there, uh, but also the federal dollars. Uh, but they may not always be a swing state. There are lots of states that haven't, that have moved from being, a, they used to be a swing state and now they're not. Um, so they, they need to appeal to them on that it's, that it's really right, the right thing to do. And by, and by the way, every Florida legislature, uh, legislator, represents both Democrats and Republicans. And so they should be representing all the people and all the people in the state should have a right to have their vote count and not have, not, uh, have it be um, uh, counted, you know, because the, you know, the, the, uh, it's, a, it's a winner take all uh, in a swing state and that every vote uh, should be equal to every other vote. Thank you. So I have a related question for you. Um, so a person here ha lives in Texas and they feel that they've reached out to their legislator and their legislator said, this isn't a state issue that can only be done through a constitutional amendment. So they're wondering what uh, is being done and what can be done to educate state legislators about this initiative. Yeah, look, I think that is a very big problem for us. I mean, uh, traditionally when we approach a legislator, they A, knee jerk against us because they think Al Gore and Hillary Clinton would be president as a Republican. And B, they think this ought to be done through a constitutional amendment because they don't understand that Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution does this. But it is an educational battle. Um, you know, I remember going to Oklahoma and speaking to the largest Tea Party group there. And, and I walked in and, and literally 99%, I asked everybody, I said, how, how many of you think this is a bad idea? And every single hand in the, you know, in the, in the room went up. And the moderator says, well, it's unconstitutional. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting. And I pulled out my pocket constitution and I had it from the Heritage Foundation and I opened up the Article 2, Section 1. And I said, okay, Mr. Chairman, would you mind reading Article 2, Section 1? And he read it and everybody there just sat there and their jaws dropped. And I said, now I happen to be a strict constructionist and I believe it says what it says. And it says the state legislature should and has the right to determine how these are you know, done with. And everybody in the room was shocked. They didn't know that was in the constitution. So I think that the only thing you can do is have you know, your handy pocket, your pocket constitution available. If you are in a Republican state or talking to a Republican legislator, ask them, say, please take a look at Article 2, Article 2 Section 1 and tell me what you think it means. And, you know, what happened in the past was we had 45 competitive or 50 competitive states and the political parties weren't as powerful as they are today. But today, Texas is ignored because we are such a solidly Republican state. Can I weigh in on that, Eileen? Yes, please. So, um, not only not only should you have the legislator read the Constitution and solve to yes, because that's pretty powerful, but then you might also suggest, as you know, there are more than one way to select electors, because we have two states who don't do it the way the rest of the states do it. So we already have precedent that it's not every state does it exactly the same way, and so even when you're talking about legal battles. Um, it's going to be very difficult to prove to the court that 
you know, we can't change it because this is the way it, it, it well, no, it's not because Nebraska and Maine actually do it different way. And this isn't the only proposal on the table. There are lots of proposals. I've looked at them all. Um, and I used to be, let's go with, let's go with congressional district like we do in Maine and like we do in Nebraska, because I think that's a superior system to the one we have. But then I looked at the national popular vote, which I originally had the knee-jerk reaction to the Paul talk, uh, Saul talks about. And um, I said, you know what? You're right. This is even better. And because of all the benefits uh, that come out of it and that it is indeed, uh, I think it's unassailably constitutional. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one of the questions is about something that you said earlier, Rick, about the mandate uh, that presidents don't have when they, you know, win a national popular vote or when they don't win a national popular vote, excuse me. You talked about it with 2016 that Hillary Clinton was going for a mandate. What kind of impact do you think that that has on our governing now when we have presidents not having that mandate from the people? It, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. One of the things we get wrong in our, in our politics is understanding how to move the country. People say moving the Congress is actually is, is, uh, very easy. Moving the country is hard. But the, con the, the Congress will move if the country moves. And I'll give you a, a couple examples. In, in uh, 1994, um, a crazy man named Newt Gingrich, who I worked for for about 10 years, was running around and telling people that welfare was a terrible system, we ought to change it. And you can imagine how you can demagogue welfare. You know, people will be eating out of, you know, on the, sh out of streets, there'll be homelessness, uh, old people will be eating cat food, you know all the arguments. Well, guess what? Newt won that argument with the country. And 101 Democrats voted for welfare reform because he had, uh, because he had moved the country. And so you've, got, you've, you've really got to focus um, on, moving, on moving the country, and then the Congress will move. And it's the same in the state legislatures. That's just the way our system works. No politician goes out and forms a parade. But if you form a parade, guess who's going to jump in front of that parade and claim to lead it? Those will be the politicians, and that's that's all right. That's the way our system, that's the way our system is built. Uh, but if you and that's what you're doing, I mean, you know, what Saul and I are trying to do is we're trying to create a national movement. And as soon as people are convinced that that's what the people want, the politicians will move. They'll, they'll change it. It'll be very simple to change once they understand its benefits. And that's already happened in many many states. And we just we actually just have a few more to go. Yeah, and I'll, um, I'll just add on to that, because um, that's absolutely something that can be really powerful in this movement, is individuals getting engaged and reaching out to their state legislators. So a really easy way that you can do that right now is if you just go to nationalpopularvote.com slash write, W-R-T-E, you can put in your zip code and it'll take you to a form that you can write an email to your state legislators and your governor right now, letting them know that you want to see action happen on this bill. Um, if you want to get more involved, you can sign up to volunteer on our website as well, and we'll get you involved with the grassroots groups in your state that are advocating for this because, you know, legislators, it's helpful. It's very helpful to hear from people uh, like you, Rick, and, you know, people like Saul go around lobbying, but legislators also, it's extremely invaluable for them to hear from their constituents on this kind of topic. Um, a few more questions that we've got here. Um, so this can be for either one of you. Um, a question's coming in about uh, states considering changing their electoral votes via action of the state legislature, you know, potentially after people vote. I think this is something that we're seeing uh, being talked about possibly in Pennsylvania. There was, there's some more news coming out about it today. Um, so do either of you want to comment on that and, and what, you know, how that kind of relates to the national popular vote efforts? Yeah. So look, right now there's no restriction with regards to um, state legislatures and changing, changing the way they vote. So if, if you happen to have a three-way Democratic state or a three-way Republican state and you didn't like the way the results were, were done, you could theoretically uh, change your law and appoint different electors. I mean, actually, Florida actually even considered doing that in, in 2000 when the state legislature gave, uh, at that time, it was uh, Tom Feeney, I believe, was the Speaker of the House, and they gave him the right to pick the electors, uh, win or lose. And so the current system allows that to happen. Under the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, we actually, in the agreement, it's an 888-word agreement that all the states agreed to, they basically agree that you won't game the system. 
that if you get in and you're in on July 1st, that you can't get in or get out of it until after the uh, inaugural. So you can move, you can actually, your legislature can vote to get in and out, but you've agreed by contract, by compact, to basically be in that uh, compact through the election and going out into the uh, uh, inaugural. So it avoids the gaming of the system where somebody could say, hey, I didn't like the results and we're a completely you know, democratic state or a completely Republican state. And if our state played the game, we could do that. And the fact is, if you go back historically, there's lots of examples where a solidly democratic state or a solidly Republican state in a close election could have done that. And it's just not something that is acceptable. It's not a norm. I mean, that would be such a radical move for someone to do so partisan that 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 I think people would, would regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. I mean, to me, it's like packing the court. You know, it's just such a partisan move that it just doesn't make sense for people. So if you there, there's still a semblance of fairness that goes across, you know, party lines. And I think that gaming the system is not what people are looking for. And you talk about the compact, you know, as an, a contract, because that's what it essentially is, a contract between states. But who is it enforced by that states don't withdraw between that six-month period? Well, I mean, look, the Supreme Court has, has, has ruled that the, the agreement between the, the states is basically like a super contract. It is, it is the highest level. And there's no, con there's no compact that has ever been able to be broken by a state without following the terms of that contract. And it's been upheld at least, I believe, three times that someone has challenged different compacts to the Supreme Court. So it, I, I forget, I'm not a lawyer, so I forget what the technical term is, but it, it is considered you know, a super contract, so to speak, and uh, the Supreme Court has upheld it. And so it is agreement between the states and, and uh, uh, something that has never been able to be you know, um, overturned or, or, or pulled out of uh, by violating it. You can get out of also, it, conditions how to do it, but you can't do it you know, uh, surreptitiously. Also, Eileen, you have a you have a tremendously powerful built-in political check in that, because what you what the state legislators would be doing is overriding the popular vote of that state. Remember, they're they're giving their electors to the to the winner of the national popular vote. So you know, if they've agreed to it uh, from the beginning, um, I, I think I think that people they really, you know, you got to follow through on your word. You can't change the con, the, you know, the terms of the contract. Um, so I think it have a, I think it have a, a powerful political check on it. And, and it's important what Rick is saying is that because if we go into a national popular vote on July 1st of a presidential year, it will be the biggest news that we've ever had with regards to electoral reform. So everybody in the country will be talking about the fact that we've just changed how the system works. And now every vote in every state matters and every voter will care. And I think you're going to have 40 states have higher voter turnout. So what Rick is saying is actually probably the most powerful uh, check on that system is that you're going to have we the people, so to speak, uh, out there voting across the entire country and participating for a first time in a national popular vote for president. And the idea of some legislature on a partisan banner playing this game is almost unfathomable because it would be the most partisan thing anybody has ever tried to do in, in, in our country's history. Yeah, and it wouldn't be just seen by their own constituents in their state, but it'd really be on the national, Absolutely. if not the international stage. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, well, with this, we are running right up to the end of this session. Um, so I just want to uh, give each of you a moment or two if there's anything that you want to say before we close here. Well, I'll just say really quickly, when I, when I originally wrote my book, Still Right, I included uh, the national popular vote as sort of a, uh, in a chapter uh, of a series of different reform ideas. And the publisher liked the national vote so much, he asked if I could just write a one single chapter on the national vote. And I said, I'd love to do that. And I couldn't, because I kind of, in a sense, snuck it in there because I thought it was really important, but I wasn't sure the publisher would think it was a really, you know, an important idea. He thought it was such an important idea. He wanted it to give it its own chapter. Um, and so I, I encourage people to look at the national popular vote and really study it. Don't just have a knee jerk reaction. Just say, well, maybe, maybe Rick and Saul are on to something. Maybe they're right. Let me check it out. And after you check it out, I, I think you'll find it has a lot of merit. And I'll, I'll just add that. I think that the key here is that this is a nonpartisan issue. I mean, I think this is a kind of issue that we're, we're looking for things that Republicans and Democrats can do together. And the reason that this works in a nonpartisan manner is it's quintessentially fair. 
All we're saying is let the best person win um, and let them make their case to the American people. And, and whether they pick a Republican or a Democrat or even a third party candidate, you know, I'm OK with that. I mean, I think that's exactly what we intended to do. And so, you know, part of the whole idea of this one is that, you know, we have Republicans. There's a lot of national Republicans and people who've been involved in politics for many, many years who basically think this makes sense and that this is something we ought to consider. And so, you know, for those of you that go back to the question earlier about what do I tell a Republican legislator, say, look into it, you know, check it out, find out why it is constitutional, why it is your not only right, but obligation to make sure that the state of Texas or any other state is well represented with regards to how the Electoral College currently works. And by making sure and guaranteeing that whether you're a Republican or Democrat, that every vote in every state is politically relevant every time. And the winner of all 50 states in the District of Columbia is the next president of the United States is something that you know, virtually every poll I've ever seen has an overwhelming majority of the people supporting that concept and believing it's the right thing to do. Thank you both so much for joining me this afternoon. I really appreciate your time. Uh, I know that our, our volunteers and all the people that tune in appreciate your perspective as well. Um, if you are interested in hearing more of Rick's thoughts, you can check out his book, Still Right, um, available wherever books are sold. Um, and if you want to get more involved with National Popular Vote, um, please do check out our website, sign up at nationalpopularvote.com slash volunteer to get involved with our movement. Um, you know, it's really critical that we have people across the country reaching out to their legislators and working with us to make sure that they know how important this issue is to them. Um, as we're gearing up for next year, you know, we're going to have uh, hopefully a, a hearing on this bill in Virginia later this year, and then it's going to be introduced in a number of states at the beginning of next year when the legislative sessions start again. Um, so we're really looking forward to that and have a, a lot of work ahead of us uh, and we need your help to do it. So I hope that all of you will consider getting involved. And again, thank you so much, Saul and Rick, for your time. This was excellent. I really appreciate it.